Welcome to Fitness and Consciousness. My guest today is Todd Scheidt. He's the owner of Awaken. It's a personal training studio on 11th and College Avenue in Indianapolis. And we're here today to uh, listen to his message, see what he's all about, and uh, see where we end up. So thanks for being on the show, Todd. Uh, thanks for having me, Ryan. Um, you know, I'm really just excited to be on a podcast. This is my first time doing this. Uh, and I think we have a lot of great things in Indianapolis. And when Ryan reached out to kind of talk, um, talk with me and to kind of hear my thoughts on uh, what I do for strength, fitness, and wellness, I had to take him up on it. So thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's, um, I've known about you for a while because we, we both have the Strong First certification. And I've, I've driven by your place um, a, a lot of times. I, I live not too far from here. So what made you uh, choose the name Awaken? Well, the, the Awaken um, kind of name came from uh, kind of just like, I'd say, taking it back uh, to my background. Uh, before I got into, you know, fitness and strength or whatever you want to kind of call this journey that we're on, uh, in college I weighed 285, 290 pounds at, at the start. Uh, prior to any, you know, exercising or finding a barbell or finding a kettlebell. And so I kind of just had one of those aha moments, um, you know, call that the wake up call, call that the finally it clicks in where, you know, you have these thoughts and you have these um, intentions to maybe get into shape or you don't realize what's going on until you have that, you know, literally deep sense of I need to change something or I need to get going on this path or I'm going to have to settle for this. I had that wake up call when I hit that kind of weight point on the scale and just that feeling of I need to do something now. So that's kind of what I brought into um, my brand with Awaken was I think we all have stuff with inside of us, uh, you know, whether it's related to fitness, whether it's related to your business, whether it's related to um, your relationships with people that I think there's more inside of us than that sometimes we let on. And so I think if we actually get to working on what we truly want, we can all obtain that. And sometimes it just takes waking up to do so or hitting that moment of um, let's change this now. I have seen your posts uh, where you showed your um, what you looked like back then. There was, I think, uh, I remember like one where you're like on a boat with your, your shirt off and um, then you're like you're current and you're doing like pull ups with 100 pounds or whatever it is that you hang from you. And so what, um, like what method did you start off with to start losing the weight? Uh, so really like it's one of those things where i had dabbled with i i'd been overweight really since i would say my whole life i've kind of been overweight always maybe semi-athletic up until like ninth tenth grade but then that's where i stopped playing athletics and so like during those times like i have lost weight before and i kind of knew what would work but the thing was is i never made like kind of a deep enough connection to that goal of losing weight and so when I finally had that click in my head that was like, all right, time to really get it, like you've worked on this before, I really just kind of went back to what I had dabbled with before. And that was kind of just like basic free weight machines and then doing uh, cardio. So cardio machines were just like, you know, the bike, the treadmill, stuff like that. Things that I actually don't even really necessarily recommend today to my clients, but it was what I knew at the time. And so... I knew if I just started expending calories that some weight would start to come off. And I knew if I did some machines, I always, you know, you know I'd lifted weights before and I think pushing weight is fun. So I kind of just used that. My form may have been awful at the time. Um, I relied on friends, you know, to just kind of give me advice. I remember one of my friends was just like who I looked up to, I guess, in terms of, okay, it looks like he's in shape. What would he recommend? I put myself out there and was vulnerable and I asked, hey, what do you think would help me? And you know, he said, crush legs, hit legs, big muscle groups. And so I just stuck with the most basic information that I could take in. And I was like, I'm going to crush this and literally just pursued that for probably the first six months of my transformation. Yeah, that's really good advice. The leg squats and deadlifts. And uh, so how did you find out about Strong First? 
So flashing forward a little bit into my Strong First days, um, I really didn't find out about Strong First um, until after graduation. Uh, so I graduated from, after my freshman year when I lost all my weight, I then actually changed my major. Um, I wanted to be Kelly School graduate business guy, uh, went there originally for that, was going to get into you know small business or maybe go corporate. But after losing the weight, I had never felt better um, about myself. And I didn't actually even know that a person could feel this good. And I think that's one of the things that overweight people or obese people often say is like, we just don't know what good feels like until we actually experience it. And so once I did that, I was like, okay, I want to help other people do this. So I then kind of switched my major to kinesiology, uh, graduated with my health and fitness specialist certification or degree. And... Upon graduation, um, I was lucky enough, I guess, during the time around my graduation to work with uh, the dean of the business school at the time at, of IU. And so we did a race together that took us to Chicago. And I'd never been really to Chicago before, um, had a good time. I was like, man, I could picture myself maybe training up here. And he, he encouraged me to kind of take that path and so I went to Chicago, ended up getting uh, my first tr like big training job, I guess, with Equinox on uh, Michigan Avenue in Chicago after graduating, after graduating. So that would have been like in 2012, 2013, or the spring of 2013. And my manager there, um, fitness manager, Amanda Pizzullo, she's Strong First certified, and she actually... Um, got me into doing it um, there's a few other trainers there um, you know that I really looked up to and that they were also like RKC or strong first certified and I was just like man I think these guys are on top of it um, and one of the things that attracted me to strong first and the whole methodology behind it is really the fitness minimalism that it provides you know we do things that you know they're basics but if you do them really well and you do them to develop a skill that skill set's going to last you for your lifetime. It's no longer just something you have to do. It's something that you can practice. It's something that you perform. It's not, I'm hitting the treadmill for 45 minutes so I can go eat. It's, I got to get better today. And I found that incredibly, um, you know, just inspiring kind of. Like, I was like, I no longer have to work to lose weight. I can just practice and get better at something. And naturally, the weight, the strength will come. Yeah, it's because of Pavel Sadzul and it was the RKC at the time. That's what got me into um, training again after a, a long uh, break from... Uh, I started as a trainer in 1999 and then I got out of it after a couple of years because of um, like what I... Like we were talking before, like... I was working at this place and it was it seemed to be the most successful personal training studio in in town and I didn't like what I thought it took to be successful like I, I felt like you, you couldn't really it was like almost like the better you were the harder time you were going to have but if you were like mediocre well that's where most people are so if you want to be this mediocre trainer then you're probably going to start off better than someone else who's excellent. And excellent might look like you're doing two different things. You're doing swings and get-ups. You're doing uh, something like that. So th it was, yeah, the um, the strictness of a small number of things is what I found really attractive from um, uh, what Pavel was talking about. So you went on to get your certification and like c compared to um, so I didn't go to college I started as a trainer I was just 19 or 20 years old when I got certified by ACE and that was in 1999 and so c like can you explain the difference like why bother getting certified by strong first if you already had a degree uh, like so going into I guess like strong first and like you know, I back strong first a hundred percent, like not saying that it is the end all be all, but as far as giving a certification out where they mean what they say, 
and they follow up with you and they make sure that you're not earning this certification just because you paid X amount of money. Um, that was huge for me. Um, you know, I have my degree. I got really, you know, quality instruction, I think, as far as like how to work with maybe special populations, um, maybe some older populations, um, you know, out of the hospital. Like, that's great. And I, I learned some business side of things, but I didn't really get into um, so much working with like an instrument like the kettlebell where we got so precise with everything and where you could just learn how to see it. And that's what they do in Strong First is like, you know, we have we have trainers there that still they're they've been doing swings for 10 years they'll still have another strong first trainer come and look at them and make sure that they're doing a movement properly what type i mean like that is like if you just put yourself in that culture that's going to make you better and part of like getting better or stronger is the people that you surround yourself with and strong first has some of the best people as far as what they expect from you how they treat you and i think that's one of the things I still love learning other methodologies and mixing it in, but as far as having a base of something, I'm like, I want to surround myself with this culture, with people that want to see you do really well and that you can also teach and they'll be receptive to that. Uh, being receptive to, shoot, yeah, that swing looked good, but it could be even better. Um, I think that's huge. And that's something where like lifelong, we need those practices that we can continue to grow with. And I see strong first as something that I can continue to grow with, um, no matter where my training kind of takes me. Yeah, that, that, I, I agree with all that. It's, so I've seen trainers with degrees and even, even master's degrees in like exercise science of some sort and you watch them squat and they don't know how. And it's, it's like, so how, but you're not gonna have a, a strong first trainer that does not know how to squat. They do not exist. And so while the one with the master's degree might be better at like taking a, some kind of a test than me, they maybe they know more about like gas exchange stuff and they can beat me on like chemistry stuff. But it's like, if you don't know how to squat, what are you doing? Like it, so that was something with, with Strong First is like, so if like, if I was gonna get certified again, well, Pavel was the one that made me even want to get certified again. So it, it is cool to see people that do have these degrees. And a lot of Strong First trainers are doctors and various types, but somebody that like you, that you already had the degree, and then you see the strong first. Like, oh, I'm going to do that, and it's um, it, it's just it it validates the system even more. That it's you know the the written test was probably not not so hard for you. I mean, it, it was tricky, and you're fatigued and sore at the time. But uh, so, did you have uh, like what was the hardest part of getting certified through strong first for you? Uh, I'd say the strongest part uh, or the hardest part uh, was um, really just having the confidence within myself. I mean, like I expect a lot from me and I know I'm capable of it, but still like, you know, you, you get those nerves prior to that five minute snatch test for your first time. You're all lined up. I did my uh, tests at uh, uh, the Dome in uh, Chicago, which is like the biggest strong first event. Um, and I, I think I got my certification in like 2014 or something and it was just filled with so much energy and I was like looking around and you know I still at the time like I'm I'm fresh out of school kind of I mean I was a year out I've been working at this gym and I've been training and I was you know really putting in a lot of time and I you know felt ready but still when you get there you're just seeing all these other strong people you're seeing you know jacked dudes you're seeing like women that you're just like whoa like everyone here is so strong. Like, I hope I can kind of stack up, but like, you know, and that's where you kind of put it to the test. It's just like, and I honestly, like that weekend I prepped so well. And thanks to, you know, my manager. And like, I spent some time with some guys at, uh, uh, rebel strength and conditioning in Chicago, uh, Ryan Hadley at the time. And then Mike Connolly, um, you know, I went there and I, I put myself into their eyes too before, so I could even have like some good pointers and tips going into the weekend. And so I did feel actually really well prepared, but still just kind of like getting through the weekend, um, you know, 
was just overall just like a terrific experience and even kind of just talking about it makes me excited um, about that weekend. And I have to say too that um, I think you made a terrific point kind of on um, maybe the the type of trainers like I think there's the educated trainers which I really think you can be educated but then there's also um, you know the guys that maybe just look at movement and see it and understand what a good squat looks like or they know how to teach a squat but they don't necessarily know maybe the science behind it and I feel like what's funny is is I probably knew more book knowledge when I was in school um, than almost maybe I'd like to admit now um, but I've learned how to walk the walk a little bit more you know before I used to maybe just know some pages and I can recite you some information but through my changes and what I've learned is like the more I let myself kind of get out of the book and actually put myself into the practice, the more I find that I can actually get deeper into my own strength and be able to actually help people realistically rather than just recite information. Yeah, the the Strong First manual was like 120 pages or something like that, 130 pages, and they, you don't get it until... Friday when you get there and the test is Sunday and um, yeah the whole weekend it was uh, I prepared for it by myself I had two lessons from um, a guy named Rick Hughes he's uh, he was certified through Pavel and the RKC and then certified by Valerie Fedorenko and at the time when I got lessons from him I wanted to get um, certified by um, through Valerie Fedorenko, and then just a couple weeks before my my test, it like something changed with how Valerie does his certifications, and so that they got canceled, and then I decided to go back to Pavel's way. I started out with Pavel's way, then I learned about Valerie, and if you don't know who Valerie Fedorenko is. Imagine doing 911 push presses with a 70 pound kettlebell without putting it down. That's 911 70 pound kettlebell without putting it down, switching hands every 10 reps. And he did that as a tribute to 9 11 um, when the um, trade towers were attacked. And the guy's from Russia. And to me, that was so powerful that he can come here from Russia and have that kind of. Uh, respect and put himself through that he could have done 912 he probably could have done a thousand but 911 was <laughs> plenty and I got really into his method after that and then I was able to do I did 90 push presses with 70 pounds myself after like uh, six weeks of trying or something like that I did I start off with like 30 or something like that and then I added 10 per week and it took me like about 20 minutes I think and it took him like an hour f and a half to do 911 <laughs> I mean just the imagining that is just mind-blowing but um, I forget what my, my point was with with all that but I'd like to I'd like to ask you a question on that uh, how did you feel um, with the two competing kind of styles uh, there, I think one's maybe more, he's more kettlebell sport, correct? Yeah. Versus hard style kettlebell, uh, which is more strong, which is strong first style. Um, how do you enjoy blending the styles together? Is your practice now uh, mutually inclusive or do you gravitate more towards one or the other? Well, with, uh, so with sport style, Um, it's kind of like this, this circular um, argument or circular debate and so with sports style you can probably do a lot you can probably do more um, so if you're doing push presses strong first style you're you're not going to get 911 of them I mean unlikely so what it would look like is you're when you come down to the in the in the rack position your elbow sits on your um, on your hip, so it's bone uh, structure that is holding it up, and then your so that you're in spinal flexion. So it was after 
after I did 90, so I was scheduled to do 100 the next week. And, but in the meantime, I read from a Pavel book to read Stuart McGill's book. So I read Dr. Stuart McGill's book, uh, Ultimate Back Fitness and Performance. And it was like, okay, I can't do this spine flexion thing anymore. Or, <laughs> uh, so I went back to, to hard style. And so that hard style meaning you don't allow spine flexion in the rack position. So I have found though that with the snatch, maybe um, there's a different way for everyone kind of. And so when I work with like, um, like one of the women that comes to my classes, she's there pretty much every time. Um, her, I noticed without me coaching her on it, her snatch style when I was driving the time up, now she's doing 10 minute sets. It's, it looks more like sport style and I did not teach her sport style, but I let it go. So sport style would mean, I don't know if it's, it's hard to understand on um, audio only, but like hard style, there's like when you swing, when you do the hip hinge, then you just, it goes back out like a like you would a deadlift, like an explosive deadlift, kind of. And with sports style, there's like this, um, like a like a squatting movement. There's like this double dip kind of uh, thing. It's really hard to explain. But I noticed that she started doing that on her own. So maybe it's like once you get, you like find your own way. And as long as she's doing it safely, I, I, I mentioned it to her. You're doing it more sport style, and this is fine, but there's different. So, have, do you do sport style also, or what do you uh, think about it? Um, well, I think there, I think it's, I think that's a good differentiator right there, kind of with the styles. Is that hard style? It's like what it kind of sounds. You know, you maybe started training her hard style, where the goal is maximal force, max tension. Yeah. We're trying to work as hard as we can on every each swing. Yeah, yeah, every rep is just dialed, like max force. There is no, like, you know, as Pavel says, like your rest is only when that bell is floating. Yeah. And then the rest is, it's it's relaxation. And then you're freaking swinging and, you know, working as hard as you can on each rep. I think there with the training stimulus that you provided, just kind of giving her that, okay, let's work you up into 10 minutes of snatches. That almost drived in itself a natural change to make her look for a more efficient swing that would allow her to perform those movements for that long a time. Um, so I think that could be a natural thing where if it clicks in and it feels right, I've learned chances are it could be right. We just have to like kind of work and learn and, under, and, and understand the intent of the exercise and why we're doing it. There's not really so much like for me, I love watching some kettlebell sport guys go after it like it's insane. I've never dabbled with it. Um, I know Joe Daniels, and I think he's in Covington, Kentucky, swing this kettlebell. I follow him on Instagram. I love seeing him uh, do his thing and how he teaches, and he's mostly kettlebell sport. Um, And then I'd say the majority of my guys are also like hard style, though. But I like seeing it because there are little bits and pieces that I've learned that you can kind of take and share. And you might just have happened to find the right client Um, and your lady that was able to take what you've given her, but then you're still open enough to say, oh, we don't have to just stick to hard style to do this. You let her kind of evolve it into her own thing. And that, as, as long as she's not getting injured, as long as you see that it fits and looks good for what the prescription is, or, you know, like what you're asking her to do, there's no reason why why I say, you know, you have to stay in hard style or you have to do kettlebell sport. I think it could be a mix of both. Yeah, the reading Dr. Stuart McGill was, it's like, how can, how can I argue with him? So if you're not familiar with Stuart McGill, he's, he works with um, either with elite athletes, professional strongmen, UFC fighters, um, Olympic um, athletes of all sorts, or populations where, or like if someone's back problems are so bad, they went to these other four doctors that couldn't help, then they'll go see Dr. McGill. 
and because it, it's kind of the same. So if you, um, the elite athlete has to train at the right level to get better, but not too much and get hurt. And that's what you do if you have a bad injury too. You need to train and get better, but not make it worse. So it's this like fine line that he works on, but he's, um, so his education and the experience is, is so far beyond mine. I can't really prove myself that he's wrong, but not everybody agrees with him. And so they'll say like, well, these long time kettlebell sport guys like Valerie Fedorenko, who's done probably a, a million snatches. He had a record when he was four, 15, 16, 17 uh, against men. He was the first one to snatch uh, 70 pounds 200 times in 10 minutes and he did it as a teenager. Is he wrong? I, I think he's right. So why and the so when it looks like he's flexing the spine but he's loading the hips so when the kettlebell comes down and it, it's hitting between the legs you're loading the hips more than the spine so it's like this you really have to know what you're talking about to um, understand what's going on and it's not it takes a while it takes actual practice and studying and uh, so is that why you've avoided the, the sports style because of the spine flexion? Are you familiar with McGill? Oh, yeah. So, like, I mean, McGill, he's the man. I mean, like, the big three. I mean, I think everyone knows, like, his, his big three as far as, like, um, back stuff and being able to make people feel better. You know, like, you'll hear, you know, if you're, if you're on the, you know, Instagram fitness community, if you're on the YouTube fitness community, you'll see these big names and these big strength athletes. I mean, they'll mention them. Um, and I, I like his stuff. But the underlying thing is, is no matter what information I think that we take on as trainers, like, and I think you kind of made the point, and that's where, I, that's where I've been before, is like, oh, someone with a bigger name than me is saying something different than me. They have to be right, I have to be wrong. They could be working with a different population than me. They're not working with necessarily my client. My client has a different background than their client. So in general, we could say McGill is the guy, but I'm not worried necessarily all about that because like if I hear, you know, if I have a client that maybe they're bending over and picking up stuff for their job, maybe they're doing um, something that requires actually spinal flexion. Our, our spines are designed for spinal flexion. Um, and if they're doing that, I want to make them stronger at spinal flexion. I also want to make sure that they can do extension though. And so kind of like where my training has gone is like I've, well, and then to answer your question, I've only avoided kettlebell sport mainly because I haven't made my trip over to probably see Joe Daniels or someone who's really good at kettlebell sport that I kind of just, I like going to the source that I kind of find. I use Instagram as kind of my uh, tool, I guess, so to speak, to explore and maybe, or YouTube or the internet and see who's really doing their thing. And then are they located next to me? So one of my thing is, is like a trainer needs a trainer. And so if I wanted kettlebell sport, I go find a better trainer or a coach who can teach me. And so like, I just haven't messed with it myself for that reason. I think it's awesome. And I think hard style is awesome. Um, but then just like, I'll recommend McGill stuff to people, but with some of the new stuff, um, in terms of mobility and strength and conditioning that I've been getting into, um, the functional range conditioning, the FRC methods, um, you know, following guys like Hunter Fitness. I've met him in Austin, Texas, uh, you know, for that certification. Um, Andrew Espina, um, you know, and those guys, Josh, Chimpy, Halbert and stuff. They're doing some and strong camps. I can't even remember all that. These are all just Instagram tags. But you see these guys lifting under load in spinal flexion. You see these guys moving almost like you wouldn't want to see. Like, you know, I think it was a post um, – where someone like a, a Japanese or Chinese weightlifter was, um, shoot, snatch grip deadlifting like 440 pounds with spinal flexion. And you would think, oh, that's Snap City. Mm -hmm. But the intent behind that was to work the spinal erectors more than a conventional deadlift in neutral spine would do. So he's getting more of a work for his demand and he's 
able to do that because his capacity has been built up from the basics. Would I go ahead and put a new client or the guy who's sitting at his desk all day into um, severe spinal flexion and then ask him to lift a heavy weight? Hell no. Like, I would be out of business right now. Um, but the thing is, is like you get these capabilities of people, you know, like where their demands, maybe they can handle that. You know, and I've, I've seen, you know, with gymnastics bodies and uh, some of those guys, they're doing Jefferson curls. And like before, people are like, oh, my gosh, they're just butchering that deadlift. You know, like, why are they doing that? They're hurting their spines. I guarantee you their spine is more mobile and stronger than mine is. And they might be doing something that looks just so you know, asinine to everyone else. They're like, they want to be hurt. So I think it's just understanding, I'm just rambling, that any exercise can potentially be good, um, but you just have to know why you're doing it, you know, the intent behind it, and where that client is coming from, and why should they be doing it. And I think that kind of opens it up. Most people, I'd follow McGill, but if you give me a client, maybe like your client, who is doing now conditioning work with snatches for 10 minutes spinal flexion isn't bad like if she can handle it you've built her up probably in hard style and focus on some other weak points have at it if she'll she'll start to tell too if it's not working for her i mean it, you'll you'll notice whether she starts feeling something or whether she's just like she has to switch it up or you notice something starts to go awry yeah mcgill is not a fan of the jefferson cruel and when i had um Joey on here. I don't know if you've met Joey in person, but we're in this. Um, Joey Lavelle. You, mm -hmm. you, I know you know of him and have talked to him online at least. But he says when he with his clients. Um, I don't know if you heard his show, but if he when he has them do the Jefferson Cruel, he might start them out with five pounds, and there's no hurry whatsoever to build up in weight. You're not like searching for that personal record or anything it's five pounds after a while maybe 10 15 and like the way mcgill puts it is if i'm if i understand him right mcgill's like you can kind of pick what kind of spine you want and it's when you start to combine them that you run into the problem so if you want the bendy spine you can have that but don't don't expect it to uh be super strong don't expect to have like the world record deadlift and be a contortionist because your spine's gonna mold in the way that you're training it and somehow the combination is um, what gets people in trouble so yeah it's a matter of like who, who's right and like you said you just bought this uh, uh, BOSU ball and um, it's the Bosu Elite, and um, the, the guy who invented them, David Weck, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I've had several conversations online with him trying to understand um, why, why are we using the Bosu ball, and, it, and it's not like, he does not use it the way you typically see it, like standing on one leg, doing a, a curl with an eight-pound dumbbell or something like that. He's using it as something completely different. It's like this compression thing. It's, it's not really just about balance. It's this compression stuff. And he does like a different kind of kettlebell swing on it. And uh, it's, but, oh, to, he was uh, like, writes like this open like letter to McGill saying like he has it wrong. Like the, the spine stuff is wrong. Of course, McGill's doing a lot of stuff right and he has you know, the clients and patients and that went from out of their sport because of injuries to back in it and win in world championships. So McGill has proven himself for sure. But what David Weck is saying is like talk about like the spinal engine. So it's like this coiling, like this uh, um, like lateral flexion, which also gets into a, a rotation and like that the spine is designed to do that and if you're running like he has shown like some uh a video where michael johnson the um track he was he was a famous track guy like in the 90s i think it was 
and he was watching Usain Bolt run, and you can hear um, Michael Johnson's uh, commentary, like basically saying that Usain Bolt is doing it wrong because his like he's not keeping his torso stiff. He's um, like his shoulders are coming down towards his hips, and so you have somebody critiquing the fastest guy in the world saying that he's doing it wrong and what David Weck is saying he's like no actually he's doing it right that's why he's the fastest guy in the world if you run with a, a stiff spine or like try to keep your torso stiff to avoid like what we would call like energy leaks then you're not going to have that spinal engine power and so we're like maybe um, McGill might say no keep the torso stiff and high level coaches Sprint coaches are saying to keep the torso stiff. Now, David Weck is saying, no, that's wrong, and we can actually prove that that's wrong. So are, are you, uh, like, interested in sprinting, the spinal engine? Do you... Um... So, I mean, to be honest, like, on the on that type of stuff, like, I'm not much of a runner myself. I mean, like, either. and I don't coach many sprinters, and I, I can't offer up any um, really good input as far as to sprinting as you should probably do it if you're into some good conditioning and if your body's capable. Um, but my thing is, is like, I think, you know, I think Weck has his points as far as like letting the spine move, letting it be free, letting it create some energy there because, you know, it's gonna, you don't wanna just hold something maybe static when you're sprinting because it's, it's elastic, it's moving. And if we're trying to restrict something, I feel like it could potentially restrict performance as well. Um, obviously these guys like McGill, I mean like, um, they could go back and forth all day on that type of stuff. I really think too, both of them are kind of right. Yeah. I can't, you know, like, I think both of them are kind of right. Depending again, I mean, like, you could train someone up, I think, as a kid to run sprints with maybe a, you know, a locked up spine or something or, or whatever. And if that's what he's been doing, that's his system that he's developed. Like, he's familiar and comfortable with that. But then I think if you're to maybe take someone else who's been taught um, maybe a different approach, letting the spine go, and he's just really done really well with that, and you tried to get him to switch, I think he would have a worse time. I think it's kind of what we've built up over time and what we've um, just really put ourselves into. Like, I think that's why athletes are kind of athletes. And in certain sports, that's why they would excel maybe in football, but be horrible at baseball. It's like, there's just different things that can't be taught. And I think that's the hard thing about training and working with bodies is you might have a good method that works with 90% of your population. So you might be considered, you know, in all sense, right. But if you get in the wrong client or not the wrong, the wrong client for you, if you get in that person and try to do your methods with them, you could be, that could be that one in 10, you know, that all of a sudden like, oh man, this is not working for this guy. And my, you know, and then you're like, it's, is it me? Am I, am I wrong here? Like it's worked for all these other people. Um, but it's not working for this guy, so what the heck? Well, yeah, he probably just has a different background or maybe he has some different experiences um, that you're not accounting for. Um, so I think there you're just looking at a higher level athlete. And that's the cool thing about, you know, Weck and McGill and all these big names. They get to work with these athletes that are such at the top of the game. But I'm still, you know, mainly working with general population. So majority of my stuff, I'd say, would work for most people. But as we get more specific and more specific and more specific, you'll find that there's going to be more lines kind of drawn as to what works or what doesn't work. Yeah, I think the McGill's way, I, I don't train uh, sprinters. Or I don't really like running myself. I might run some hills out in the woods, some trails, but I'm not. Um, a running coach by any stretch of the imagination. I used to run a lot as a kid, but uh, the also with like the the WEC method, like my girlfriend's kids are into um, track, cross country, and um, I was like trying to show them or like tell them about uh, David WEC. It's like this. He made these like uh, created these. Um, I think he calls them pulsers. And they're like these weights, and they I think they weigh like eight ounces, twelve ounces, four ounces. He has different ones, 
and like one you would use when you're sprinting, one you would use when you're longer distance, and they have like I think they have uh, know, like bearings in them or something, and so when you go instead of like like pumping your arms, you like they 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 kind of like drop down, and it's that kinetic energy that makes you run faster. So his thing is like now for the first time in history you can run faster holding weights, and that pulsing teaches you how to run faster using like spinal engine stuff and coiling and um, Steve Cotter. See, I, you know, Bosu balls like in the like strength world have kind of been like made fun of. It's like, what are these people doing? And for the most part, I think it's largely deserved because most people are not using them uh, the way Weck designed and Weck is even improving on his method. And you have, um, uh, uh, I forget where I was going with that, but you have these uh, different ways like with the, the coiling core, but for the, the most part, I think McGill, that's going to be like your, your safe way. Don't allow spinal flexion when you're deadlifting and, and uh, swinging and because for most people that's probably the right way and then if they really know what they're doing then maybe like more of the kettlebell sport where you're allowing some flexion and they know why it's not bad form you're allowing flexion no this is very intentional maybe that's kind of where it uh, comes in yeah bringing it into kind of more of my world and probably more of your world i think it's where we see you know like in deadlifting um you know rounded upper backs when deadlifting you know yes like i'm gonna teach and i'll practice a neutral spine majority of the time um you know but when i start pulling heavy weight or when i if i was coaching someone with you know, really heavy weight, if they can maintain a neutral spine and the lumbar spine, but if they need to go into or want to, and they feel strong with some flexion in the thoracic spine, that's going to get them to have a decreased length of pull in their deadlift. Mm -hmm. And they could be actually stronger in that spine and those mechanics. And as long as they stay, you know, still neutral spine in the lumbar, I'm, I'm pretty happy with them. I wouldn't want to see maybe that occurring until maybe X level, you know, where I'm, where I'm thinking like, okay, this person's probably at their capacity, you know, pretty close. Let's really get into maybe changing some things up. And that's something where I've never actually worked with someone like, let's put them into thoracic flexion. But that's something where, you know, that is that additional kind of step that you can take. You're just not going to see many people in our practice, especially in Strong First, because we're a more general population, where we're not talking super duper crazy mechanics and changing stuff like that. Um, I think the the hard part too is like we get into um, as trainers, we're so taken back and like we have all this information out with um, you know McGill and Weck and like that's some great information. I think again as I'm saying, like I think they can both be used and applied. And McGill's is probably more widely applied because we're dealing a lot of times with bodies that are sitting in behind desks. We're sitting all day. We're shutting down constantly a lot of muscles that probably should be activated or on. And so dealing with a body like that, it'll be hard enough to get someone to be able to know what maybe a neutral spine feels like let alone be able to shift their body or put their body in a different position and be able to maintain that, like especially a more advanced version. So I think the big thing is, is, you know, train with someone, get to know them, their body, um, get to know what they've been doing and where they want to go. And then I think just give them the right tools to bring up their capacity to then give them a honest, hey, you're here. I would really think this could be a good potential if you want to lift X amount more weight, or I think based on your past, this would be a good thing to um, make you run faster. Thing is, is most of the time we don't get that as a trainer. We just, the person wants to lose maybe 20 pounds or get stronger, um, and they don't necessarily know the methods, but they expect us to just deliver the best. And I think that's, or the best method for them. And I think that's, 
Um, one of the reasons, again, going back to strong first, why I think it's just a good baseline measure. And so all these trainers out here trying to figure out the very best of the very best, and that's only their way. I think it's self-limiting when dealing with general population, but it will be limiting when you deal with a very highly level adapted athlete that needs that more, this is the way because they need to buy in. Yeah, that, that does make sense. And just knowing like why you're doing what, what you're doing. And for the most, most part, I, when I'm teaching like the deadlift and it's, it's neutral spine. I'm, I'm, and like if they can't have neutral spine, I'll raise the bar up. I'll put it on some uh, blocks or something so they so they can have it, or maybe they use a trap bar instead or something like that. And yeah, it's kind of yeah you have to like know why to go to color outside the lines, I, I guess. And so when you have like a, a Weck who is you know, mostly into running. Everything he he does from his kettlebell swings are, are different. They're not sport style. They're not hard style. They're they're weck style because he wants to like load the haunches, and you're on your uh, fourth and fifth metatarsal. So it's because he wants you to be able to run faster. That's it. It's not about lifting heavier. When he's doing deadlifts, same thing. Fourth and fifth metatarsal. You're not on your heels. Why? Because he wants you to run faster. So, like where McGill, he might have that, but his clients are also professional strong men. And you're not going to tell, you know, um, Brian Shaw, like the strongest man in the world, that he needs to start doing uh, deadlifts on his, on the balls of his feet. That doesn't make any sense. Or So, knowing like why you're doing what you're doing, I, I think, is, is the main main idea so uh, what are you doing with the, the BOSU ball now so I mean and this is I mean like and honestly like you're pulling out WEC and I, I have his product over there and like for the most part I used to actually be and I still almost it's kind of funny is like I'm not really that big of a fan of a BOSU or I'm actually learning to be more of a fan of it um, because I mean, and I'll be honest with you, like I used to say, ah, don't get a BOSU. Like, why would you want a BOSU? Yeah, me too. Is yeah, because literally you just see them as, you know, as I told you earlier, kind of like they can be very much just an entertainer. Like you can have a client just stand on top of them, wobble around and maybe do some six pound, uh, you know, curls. It drives me bonkers. But you really should be having them just stand on the ground and, you know, curl some weight you know, like curl maybe 20 pounds instead of six. It just, you know, cause that's self-limiting in a fact, you know, the client might just want muscle mass and that's, or just to look better in a t-shirt. And that's like my, my clients want to get stronger, leaner, and then live just a better fulfilled life. A lot of the exercises that I give them will be just using strength and resistance, you know, in the form of body weight training, kettlebell or barbell. Um, if I give them weights, you know, like a kettlebell or a dumbbell and have them do curls on a BOSU, they won't be able to lift as much. And if they can't lift as much, that's going to restrict their ability to produce strength, produce force for what they're trying to get. Now, we might be, you know, hitting some other point by doing that that could be maybe a benefit. Maybe they're getting some sort of increased proprioception from that. Um, so that could be potentially good, but that's not what they want. And we want, we need to give people what they want with also a dose of what they need. So I'm trying to make sure everyone leaves here stronger, but then also still, you know, healthy, but then still giving them the differences in body composition that they want to see and the increase of weight on the bar or kettlebell or what have you. Um, so with the Bose, going back to that, I have kind of opened up and said, all right, Todd, like this BOSU thing, what can you do with it? How can I make this tool work for us here at Awaken? And it's been one of those things where I honestly enjoy doing a lot of core work on it. Um, as far as like core work, I'll do, you know, just using it even as just like a base for like side planks or something. I'll do, uh, you know, side planks with lateral flexion. I'll lay across of it kind of sideways and do some oblique crunches. I'll flip it over so the rounded side is down and maybe do some like planks with runners on it. Um, so where we are getting maybe some 
a stability challenge in there. We're getting some limb movement. And overall though, I feel like it's still keeping the exercise at a, at a difficulty level where we're gonna get the change to occur, but it still does kind of make it a little bit fun or different than your normal maybe TRX runner or your um, just standard mountain climber or something like that. Um, so kind of being a little bit more open in that sense. And I do like some of the feedback when like doing like a sideline oblique crunch that that kind of surface provides um, for me. And um, I'd say one of my all time favorite BOSU movements that I've done, um, which actually isn't, and I don't even actually, I'll, I'll leave his name out, but like one of the guys that I used to follow, he just does a really good like BOSU lateral crossover. And I like the lateral loading um, that it provides because it'll teach you just to tap the ball kind of really quick as you shuffle over the top and then load kind of like a skater does where you're getting that line and then shooting back across the other mm -hmm. side. You know, one of those things that trainers look at are, you know, the, the planes of motion and what we're trying to use. And a lot of my movements with, you know, um, kettlebells and with barbells and dumbbells, they're a lot in the sagittal plane. Uh, but we need to mix that up and get multi-planar and, you know, work different planes. So by bringing in that lateral movement and working a different plane, that's a fun tool to use that with. And it kind of makes them quick on their feet. And it's also a tool that I've brought in to work with some new clients that I've gotten that, um, you know, they're, they're new to training. They're brand new. And they don't have good body awareness. They're, you know, a few of them are more substantially overweight and this tool actually just doing like a little BOSU tap with your foot, just um, maybe like doing some sort of different movement with the BOSU where they feel comfortable with it, where it's not a weight, just getting comfortable in their setting. It's another thing where I've said, okay, this could work for them, I think. Well, you know, I have five people using the BOSU out of the 30 something clients that I have. And so I'll play around with it on it and do my stuff, but even most of my core training is still done on like gymnastics rings or hanging from a pull-up bar. Yeah, those are good um, things, the side planks. and Yeah, I was kind of uh, surprised in what got me to open up to the, the, the BOSU ball, which I'm not even really using them in my, with my um, clients, but I, I may. Um, you have the BOSU Elite, which I think is the way to way to go now it's more um firm that's what i like about but, it yeah it's like yeah. a different than the standard bosu which kind of yeah. when i tried it out was really kind of stood out to me Good. yeah and um but uh steve cotter who i i don't know him i've never met him or anything but um he's the one he's good friends with uh david weck and it was like through him he's like saying David Weck is a genius. People need to, to listen to what he's saying. And it's like, okay, well, Steve Cotter, I don't think he has any investment in the BOSU. Uh, you know, he's not trying to sell BOSU balls like David Weck is. Uh, so, and Steve Cotter is uh, very highly respected in the, in the kettlebell community and movement, martial art. And it's like, okay, well, if he says this dude is legit, then I need to start figuring it out. And David Weck has been um, really cool with me because I'm asking him questions. I'm not going at him like, Bosu balls suck, why do you use them? It's more like, I don't understand this. What, what do you mean by this? What do you mean compression? What do you mean it's not for balance? What do you mean? And he spells it out and these are open for people to read. It's in like Facebook comments section. So. He's a very approachable guy, and he, he will explain, and, and his, his methods go really deep, and he's making um, uh, a progress on his own system, and he's making very fast sprinters faster, like elite level. They're getting faster football players, um, baseball players, and like um, there's like, I think it was like Cal Poly, um, uh, college went from like guy think he, their trainer um i can't think of his name at the moment I, I'll, it'll probably pop up but he was like all we need is like barbells and dumbbells and kettlebells and then he learns from david weck he goes and now we need bosu balls 
So he was like this absolute minimalist guy. This is all, this is all you need. And then he's like, well, actually, we have to have we have to have BOSU balls for everybody, for sure. <laughs> I think that's the that's the funny thing too. Is this like I mean that's where strong first mentality is. And like I mean I won't do as of right now. I mean shoot, catch me in five years. You I mean I won't say we'll never do a kettlebell swing on that thing. Right now I couldn't imagine myself ever doing a kettlebell swing, especially the way that strong first has taught me and what I expect from a kettle swing. Like mm-hmm. I, I would not, you would not catch me doing swings on that, but still, if there's enough evidence that maybe comes out, I've learned in my training and what I tell my clients is like right now, like shoot, like I think I have a decent handle on what will work, you know, and I think I know a decent amount about strength, but I know that year after year I learn that I actually know not much at all because there's so much more to always learn. And there's so much that we're always expanding on. And like, you know, just even with the amount of knowledge that podcasts and the internet and is out there, I think there, you know, if you're training, I think that if you're completely closed off to a certain tool, I think you could be potentially eliminating maybe some point of advantage. So where that BOSU, it may not come into play for my training or my client's training too often. It could potentially be a tool where it works for maybe one or two of my clients, where maybe it gives them for some reason some better um, feeling or some, some sort of new sensation when we're training. Maybe it helps them open up their lateral line and their spinal flexion or something. Maybe it creates that awareness to where then that awareness can be helped to maybe perform a, a, a movement that they've been working on they, that they just haven't quite got the connection for. You know, I think like my thing is, is a lot of people have been doing a lot of things right. There's a lot of good knowledge with training out there, but I think we're dealing with bodies too that are just shut off. Um, and so like using a tool like that to maybe potentially help them get better awareness in their abs or in their obliques, maybe that will help them get tighter even on their kettlebell swings. So now... I've just used a tool that I thought was stupid, you know, Mm -hmm. a couple years ago to then potentially create better mind body awareness in a person's abs to help them with a swing that I know swings are badass. I've just kind of increased the, the level of the swing. So that's what I'm trying to do is just use, I'm trying to use these maybe other methods or these other tools to just enhance the tools that I really believe in. And I mean, I like the basics, just because I think, you know, barbells, kettlebells, dumbbells, they've been around forever and they're going to stay around. And my biggest thing is, is I want to create a body or a client that can go anywhere and do anything, anytime. And I think like if you're traveling for work, traveling for business, you can find a gym that has some dumbbells in it. You know, chances are your hotel has a, you know, a kettlebell in it now these days. That's huge. Yeah. And so if we can provide... A, you know that sort of training where they can go to their hotel they can they know okay snap well I have breakfast or something breakfast meeting at like 8 o'clock today called for strength work but I know I need some decent sleep so I'm going to put together this really sweet kettlebell circuit that Todd showed me and I can apply that while I'm at work or on, vac- on vacation I want to spend time with my family but I still know I need to keep, you know, take care of my baseline 30 minutes, boom, kettlebell, done. You know, like, that's my goal. It's because they, this, is a, this is a lifestyle thing for me, and this is a, what I want to get out of my clients is a lifestyle where they understand that, okay, maybe their program does call for strength, or maybe we are working barbell movements right now in a program, but they know how to use other tools, and they understand the intent behind them, and then they know how to use those tools to make it work for them in their real life. Real life calls for business meetings. Real life calls for vacations. Real life calls for crappy weekends, maybe with the in-laws, where they have a crappy basement gym. But you know what? They have what it takes to do it anywhere, and they understand the intent behind the exercises. So I think that's kind of like like whether you're scaling for the general population or whether the, the athlete's a super-duper star, I think it just is a matter of like, what do they need? What works for them? And then again, like I keep on going back, what works for them? And then how does this affect their life? Um, and so like, I think that's the benefit to me and like hearing these big names. And 
I've met some really smart people, some smarter people than me. And I have to only say that the best thing about my transformation was, is that I used to be on the other side of where I am today. I get to see, I saw through my eyes, like if I saw someone standing on a BOSU ball, I would, I would have that judgmental attitude and I'd be like, that's mm-hmm. stupid. Even before like I got into training, I would be like, that's dumb. Like, why are you doing that? Or you're going to make me walk around like, like an animal. Like we talked about, you know, primal movement earlier and mm-hmm. you know, that stuff is, I'm not, I'm not against primal movement. I think it's awesome. But the thing is, is that I know from my background and my history is that if I did that when I was 285 pounds or 290 pounds, I'd feel like an idiot. And my ass would be out of that gym, away from you as fast as possible, and I would never come back. That's not my intention with anyone. I want them to create a lifestyle that works for them, works for you. And a lot of these movements with kettlebells or barbells, we can actually make them work for you. Like people are like, oh, okay, like that makes sense. I look pretty good doing this. I'm not crawling around the floor and I don't feel like an idiot at first because that's what kind of it is at first. You feel stupid and you feel dumb and you're dealing with emotions that you haven't had to deal with before when it comes to exercise. We're seeing people that don't have usually good histories with exercise or with their health and they're being very vulnerable by coming to us. The last thing I also want to do is give them methods that just make them feel even stupider, like more stupid, like like maybe that. So we build them up, give them a really good skill set, maybe like strong first where we just focus on these five movements and then, um, you know, we just go from there. Then we can add in some of that maybe, you know, weirder, cool mm-hmm. stuff that people are doing now. Cause like I, I still feel self-conscious if I was to do some of that stuff in front of other people. Um, TGUs, are almost like an animal flow or animal movement maybe, but it still looks a little bit more regimented and I feel a little bit more comfortable compared to maybe like a, a leopard crawl or something. Yeah. So I think that's like, to, I guess kind of flipped the subject or ch- kind of went on a tangent there, but that's where I see training is, is like, we can have these high level methods or we can do whatever we want, but if the method doesn't fit the client, the client's not going to, take a hold of that I want them grabbing on and not letting go you know that to me because then that's lifelong change so yeah that's interesting that you um, um, say you're like you're like on the other side of that and I was I guess I was always on the um, like I was telling you before the at the last time I was an employee trainer in uh, in uh um, was uh, I didn't get a raise because of my weight. The owner looked at me like I was just disgusting. He's like, you're just thin. Of course there's no raise. And at the time I, I started there, I weighed like about 175 and I ended up losing like 20 pounds. I was still shredded and strong. As strong as I was at 175, I was like 4% body fat and doing jujitsu all the time um and so if anything like I, I had that like i was on the thinner side oh my my calves are skinny oh no i had i, I bought like a a calf machine for myself i ended up selling i don't, I don't care how big my calves are now but it, it's but it almost uh but i guess we do have that like in my jeans oh do my do my legs look too skinny in my jeans or so it's like you were on like the other side where you're on heavy, where like me, I was like more on the uh, thinner side. So um, coming at, at it like from the, the heavier point, and I know like you do like a lot of climbing now. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine when you were like 285, you, were, you probably weren't able to climb anything, right? So it was there, I was kind of like thinking, like when you were talking earlier, like, okay, when you're heavy, you're not, and now you're like climbing. You're super strong on your pull-ups, and um, like, so was there like something that, like, some kind of connection there? Like, you couldn't climb, but now you can. Or have you? Was that a big deal to you? Or I think one of the yeah. I mean, that's a that's a huge part. Um, you know, what got me into it was, you know, it's again going back to that wake-up call. It's like I'm looking around. I'm looking at my life, and I'm thinking. 
all right, like this, this could be it. I could graduate school just as heavy, 285, or if I would have kept on my route, I could have been 300. I had the thought that I could be dead though by the time I was 30. So in literally two years from now, I was like, because I had like one of the part of the wake up call like moments was I was having like a, a panic attack and um, I was just like, what the heck is going on with my life? And so one of those things is you start to see what you're doing, your actions, and like, you know, that got me to the gym. And then I was just like, then I had the weight loss. And then I was just like, I feel really good. And I had been doing just maybe like machines or something because I was too scared to even grab a pull-up bar. You know, I would have just like, you know, I had done presidential fitness tests back in the day as a kid. You know, and I could hold myself above a bar for a little while back then. But then I hadn't, I knew I would be a failure by just touching that bar at that current state. Um, and I wanted to be able to get that feeling back. I wanted to feel like I could actually, you know, that the weight loss at first gave me that confidence that I had lost. You know, I always, I think I'm very capable and I actually have, you know, confidence in myself. But when you're in that weight, you're like trapped in a prison kind of. You're surrounded and you've built up whatever, you know, it is that's caused you to get that way. It could just be, you know, you just let it happen. It could be you're eating for comfort. It could be what have you. Well, eventually that starts to outweigh you and kind of shut down your confidence. So I wanted to get that back. And I was like, when I get this back, I'm going to take it full spectrum. I'm going to go all the way. So it started off with weight loss. Weight loss gave me the confidence to then eventually, you know, take my lap pull downs and then actually grab onto a pull up bar. And the first time I actually grabbed onto a pull up bar after, you know, that year, I could actually pull myself up. But I probably could have done a pull up, you know, six months into my transformation, but I waited until I knew for sure almost that I could grab that thing and kind of pull. Because I was like, I just want to be, I just want to have this success or I just want it to, to be there. So I worked and worked and then I did it. And then that set off the, holy crap, you've probably been blocking yourself away from all these opportunities, all these other feelings of success um, and what physical fitness can do for you and strength and how it can change the way that you interact with people. And so I kept on pushing up with the pull-ups because, or pushing towards like climbing, heavy chin-ups, you know, like I've done chin-ups with 150 pounds on me, like for a single. That's awesome. I've, I've done pull-ups, you know, like, you know, with 120 pounds for three. You know, I've, I've pushed that a lot. And then I eventually though too, it's just like, okay, like that's sweet. Cause like one of my goals was I want to be able to rep out pull-ups with how much weight I used to weigh. So like put, you know, like, so I used to weigh 295 or 285, 290. I want to be able to put weight on my back and be able to pull that shit up. Like, that's just like what I was after. And now you have. And now I have. What do you, what do you weigh now? Um, so I'm probably like 190 right now. Okay. So, I mean, I could do that and then some, and then I could rep it out. But the thing is too, is that with any goal, you kind of get to see through the goal. Is it good that I was chasing that? Like that I had that goal? Yeah, it was great. It pushed me. It got me really driving hard. It got me amazing at pull-ups because people ask me, how do you get good at pull-ups? You do a ton of them and then you mix up the weight and then you mix up the grip. And it's really not that hard, but you have to want it because it's a hard exercise. But eventually time in the gym, pull-ups, you hit, you hit a point and I still have like a goal of probably pulling a chin up with 190 pounds on my, you know, on my back or 175, like a body weight chin up attached to me. Um, and I think I'll probably get that, but climbing comes in because you know, climbing's allowed me to meet some of the best friends that I've ever met before. It gives me more of a social aspect. My, my training for the longest part was me getting comfortable with me. One-on-one -on -one in the gym, put on my headphones. There might be tons of people around there, but I could actually just get comfortable with me being me again and push me to actually come up out of my shell or my prison of, you know, fat or, you know, weight or so to speak and actually put me in the real world. Climbing is kind of the same thing. It's taken me into a gym to where now I can... I can apply my strength and apply what I've worked on in myself and I can share that with others. So I can go ahead and be vulnerable in the gym. I can put myself out there in an environment where it would have scared the living crap out of me before and I can actually, I can excel. I mean, in all climbing capabilities, I still kind of suck, you know, like... You're but big for a climber. Most climbers are more like my size or smaller. Yeah, I mean, like the average professional climber weighs 150 pounds. Um, yeah. and you're looking at like, 
you know, usually like the, the ratio of arm length to, you know, height is a little bit taller, but I have like some, I just don't want to limit myself anyway. So yeah, I weigh more than the typical climber, but I just, I have a hard time not believing that if I set myself out to do something now that I can't achieve it. Like, I just think I can probably do it. And I think that's the powering thing about my training with my clients is, is sometimes I think my clients don't even know what I see in them, but I can find the weakest point in someone or see that they're feeling low and I'll be like, no, you have this shit. I believe in them. Like I can, I had to see that myself. And when you learn now to see it in yourself, you just see, okay, this person, like if they just make this switch, if they could just make this click, you can't show them the click always, but if you can change the way that they think and how they perceive, and then that allows them to alter their body or their mindset, then all of a sudden their whole world changes. My, I'm living in a completely different world than I used to live in. And that's the most powerful thing. So we're doing a lot more than just training bodies. Yeah, my favorite thing is, to, is when people do something they didn't think they could, like a, a client of mine that she lost, I think like about 45 pounds and she probably gained a, a, a few pounds of muscle or so and started like from scratch, first time working out was, was with me and then she was doing um, deadlifts more than her body weight with uh, with the trap bar from from the ground, but um, I think she might have been close with with the bar, straight bar too. But just like seeing like their face, like that what was impossible. They didn't think they could do it, but like as a trainer, like like you're just saying, we can see stuff that they can't because they have like no, you can actually do this. You you can lift your body weight even though you're. 45 you've only, you've only been working out now for a, a year or whatever it was at the, at the time and and it's like I, I know that like if, if she was working out with with you she could probably get the same kind of results but there's like this other kind of training that's like like what you're talking about like with the we were talking about with the BOSU ball you stand on one leg and you do a curl with a tiny weight and you and it, it's like more just creating like some weird firing pattern than it is like helping people. So it's cool to see you in in this gym. I, I look around, and you know it, it's it's kettlebells, maces, dumbbells, pull up bar, gymnastic strings. Got the glute ham machine and um, ski erg rower. I mean, yeah, but so it's like uh, it's not like. You walk in, it looks like a LA Fitness or something where you have 85 treadmills and stuff. I mean, it's it's all just like cool stuff. You see a bunch of barbells and the, um, trap bar and medicine balls and all kinds of just stuff that, that works. And so um, I know you have um, just a few minutes here before you have a client start. So um, it's like, I'll let you just kind of like whatever however you want to uh, finish up we have as long as as long as you want to take you can just pretty much wh wherever you want to take it you can you can yeah I mean so I mean I'm just fortunate to be um, on the podcast in the first place it's funny is because like shoot when I started this thing you know my going back again to the whole start of it 10 years ago when I first decided to like lose the weight I never thought I'd even be on a fitness podcast. It's so funny how the world can kind of take us here. And it's one of those things where, you know, if you're trying to make those changes in your life in the health and strength world or whatever, the yoga world, I, I found one of the, the biggest limiting factors was just my own self-perception of, of me, kind of. And like, um, what would others think of me or what would other people do if I went down this path that was so obscure? But sometimes going down that obscure path, and it's been for me, it's been the biggest, most powerful, life-changing thing um, that I've ever done. You know, it's just crazy. So if you're trying to work on yourself, you know, lose that 10 pounds, put 10 pounds on your bench press, deadlift, or, you know, let yourself maybe feel a little uncomfortable. You know, that's, that's the big thing, or weird, or whatever you want to call it. Let yourself try different methodologies. You'll eventually find something that fits for you. And I think strength training for, for myself and my clients, that's a big base of what our training consists of. But 
I've learned to say yes to yoga, which is like something that I was just like, oh man, that's just for like maybe girls, you know, like, like being the typical, like bro or something, you know, that was lifting in college or just starting. That's kind of like, oh, that's for girls. And now I'm like, no, that's for guys that want to be strong, mobile, or women that want to be strong and mobile. And who cares about whether it's for girls or who cares about whether it's for guys? This is training and we're all bodies and we all should train similarly. So like if you see something that's, that sparks your interest, go after it. Let go of the self-doubt or the negative thoughts that kind of maybe take over you during those times and let yourself just kind of snowball into this thing. And that's kind of what I've done here at Awaken. I went from Chicago, a corporate fitness thing, to coming back to, you know, Indy, which is just 45 minutes of my hometown. So back to Indiana. And, you know, it's one of those things then where it's just like, I think there's so much great stuff happening on in the fitness industry in Indy right now that I like being a part of it. Like, it's fun to see it grow. I've been, I've been so happy that I've been, I'm, like my two year anniversary here with the studios coming up prior to this, I was training, um, at another gym downtown and then also running sessions out of my apartments gym. And then also working at the rock climbing gym, Epic fitness. And so like my goal here is yes, I want my business to be successful and I would like awaken, but the fact that I have Ryan here with me and asked me to be a part of his podcast, Ryan's doing some great things with kettlebells and he's strong first certified. And then we have other trainers that I'm friends with, like Drew up on the north side with Perform Daily Fitness. We have climbing gyms on the north side, Epic. We have a bouldering gym in the works. This is what it's going to take to help start changing Indiana's and Indy's perception of fitness and strength and the lifestyle here. And I've been, you know, again, with my travels for education, you know, I've been to Portland, I've been to Austin, I've been to some really cool cities that are deemed healthier, you know, Denver than Indianapolis. But I think, you know, together, it's going to take the trainers with these thoughts and with these just passions, like give me passion, and we can produce something great. And I think that's what we have here going on in Indy right now. And it's so exciting to be a part of. So I think that's kind of it. Like, it's not, it's like, it's not about me. It's not about, um, you know, the weight that I could lift or what I, my training methodology is here. It's what we can do now in unison to make the city as a whole healthier. What can we do? And at first that did start with changing myself. And I think that's, you know, with politics and not trying to get into that here in the last little bit, but I have to say, like, if we want to see that good change, that positive change, it often takes, you know, place in ourselves first. And then that's allowed me to become a better, stronger person. So then the people around me can also feel free to grow stronger. And I think that's like why awaken your strength is my, my motto. You know, I want you to be the strongest version of yourself. So that way I can be the strongest version of myself. I don't want anyone bringing me down and I don't want to try to bring you down. Now that won't, that doesn't mean I won't give some shit to my friends, Mm -hmm. but I will bring you up, let you grow. And I think that by sharing my techniques with strength, it can help you be a better business person. It could help you be a better wife. It could help you be um, a better grandfather. Um, So it's about making your life the best life it can be. And I think kettlebells, barbell, body weight, any sort of training can potentially do that for you, especially when done with intent and with purpose and with a good goal in mind. Yeah, yeah, couldn't say it better. Yeah, your your motto is very similar to mine. I say something like, uh, I, "I want to help people find their strength." Yeah, and it's you know it's it's not just about the kettlebell. It's like d- developing the the spirit. And so, if, if people want to, any other closing thoughts, or how can people get a hold of you? Uh, so you can follow. Uh, I'd say like um, follow us on Instagram or social media. I think. Facebook, we're just um, Awaken Strength Performance Wellness. Um, on Instagram, we're Awaken317. Uh, email is Awaken317 at gmail.com. If you have questions, you could shoot me a message there or like tag us on something on Instagram. Um, I also have Todd Scheit Fitness as my like more personal um, fitness thing. Um, so, yeah, you'll see, you can see how I kind of train personally. 
but I also have that separate Instagram for Awaken if you want to see more what's going on with my clients and what's going on with the gym life and stuff like that. And then um, you'll see me share some stuff too from when I visit our friends at like Epic and some other gyms around the area. I really try to do, I'm trying to make it more of a point to visit and bring up um, other areas, you know, like the yoga, like, you know, the hot room downtown, you know, everyone should get involved in this because, you know, it's not just me. Maybe it's, maybe it's getting someone introduced to yoga first. And then once they get good at yoga, then they'll be like, or you can't really ever get good at yoga, but you know what I'm saying? Like it may take yoga to eventually get them to come here to me or to see me, or it may take me to eventually get them maybe into climbing, or maybe they'll go to me and be like, do you know kettlebell sport? No, I don't, but you should probably go see Ryan because it sounds like Ryan knows what the hell he's doing. So it's that type of behavior where we can bring each other up. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think like with the, with the podcast, it's like so somebody might think, well, why would I have another Strong First guy on that's right down the road from me that's my competition? It's like, not my competition. You're a completely separate guy. You're, you're your own competition. How... How good can you make yourself? How good can I make myself? And and I realized when I was doing um, workshops, and I was doing some workshops by myself, when it got to be too many people, I didn't think I could do a good job by myself. I asked someone to help me, but it was me doing, you know, running the show. And then I, I was designing another one. I was like, well, maybe I'll get some other trainers that are better than me at these different things, and they can teach whatever they want. I choose the trainer because I think they're awesome and then they tell me what they're going to do they might like run it by me and I'm like yeah that sounds awesome so it's like the whole is greater than the sum and it's just the more we can like spread the word maybe somebody likes your style better than mine we, we have a lot of overlap but there's you know some differences and so it's like the more we can just like spread it out the more it spreads out and it's I don't, I don't see it as a com- competitive thing at all if, um, not if we're all working together like that. So, uh, thanks for being on the show, Todd. This this was a really fast uh, hour twenty one or twenty two. Yeah, it went by fast, man. I had a great time. Thanks for having me on. Uh, hope to do it again. Maybe we can train yeah. uh, sometime here soon, and then um, just keep on getting everyone stronger, uh, faster, healthier. Yeah, sounds good. You have an open invitation to come on again. We have. I think we have endless uh, conversations that we can have on here. So thanks again. If you want to get a hold of me about the show, it's fitnessandconsciousness at gmail.com.